I know this isn't something most of us think about related to dementia and dementia caregiving, but one of the things we need to consider is what our life looks like when we are completed with this journey. Today's interview is with Dennis Dolniak, who is a widower of his wife, Nancy, and our interview is talking about how Dennis found loving purpose after his dementia caregiving journey is completed. And I invite you today to listen to this episode because as difficult as it is to think about, when we are finished being a family caregiver of anybody, but particularly a person living with dementia, we need to consider what our own life and our own health and our own well-being is going to be when we finish the marathon. So Dennis has a tremendous vision, and I'm here to support him in that vision. Now, if anything that you hear on this podcast has led you to feel like you wanted to be able to actually ask a, a dementia coach a question, I'm very excited to announce that one night a month, I'm going to be opening up a free Ask the Dementia Coach session this First one will be April 25th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you are curious about what it's like to actually have your questions answered, I invite you to sign up for this free one-hour time block where I will be gifting the opportunity to speak with me related to any dementia caregiving questions you might have. And we kick these off on April 25th at 6 p.m. Eastern. And the link will be in the show notes for you to register so that you can get access to the Zoom room. I hope you take me up on this offer. It is a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to serve you. So check out episode 105 how one widower found loving purpose after a dementia caregiving journey. Have you recently found out someone you love has dementia, struggling to wrap your head around how to be a Christian caregiver? Searching for answers by joining countless Facebook groups but find them toxic? Learning how to cope with dementia feels difficult but learning a Christian caregiving worldview can be easy. Hey, brother and sister in Christ, I'm Lizette, occupational therapist, pastor's wife turned dementia coach and a daughter of dementia. In this podcast, you will learn the truth that the way to make dementia care easy is your faith. Knowing that a loving God has decreed this hard providence in your life makes all the difference. Here you will gain skills. You will be challenged by what God says in his word about caregiving, and you will learn exactly what dementia is and is not. Find clarity and certainty from God's word so you have perseverance for this journey. Use science-backed solutions and biblical principles to redeem your time. Praying this blesses you as we dive into dementia from a Christian perspective. Let's glorify God despite dementia. Well, welcome to today's episode of Dementia Caregiving for Families. I have a very special guest here today who I'm only going to introduce as Dennis because when I look at his name, kind of when I look at when people look at my name, I butcher it. So I'm not going to say his last name, but he is from Nana's Books Foundation. And we met in a very special and unique way. And when I met him and heard his story, I decided he was a good person to have on this podcast because his, his foundation is doing great things, uh, but in just a little bit of a different way. 
So welcome to today's episode 105. And Dennis, thank you so much for being here. Now you can tell people your last name. I'm pretty sure I can do it, but just on the off chance, I'm not going to butcher it. Well, Lizette, I am thrilled to be with you. Good to see you again. My name is Dennis Dolniak, and I live down in Orlando, Florida. And we had the opportunity to meet at a special opportunity, and that was on a cruise ship. Oh, wasn't it spectacular? The cruise ship was actually sponsored, actually put together by Kathy Schof from mm -hmm. Elite Travel, who does these dementia-supported cruises. And this was my eighth cruise with Kathy uh, as a member of the staff, as a member of the uh, report team, support team, presenters, and dining companions. Uh -huh. And Lizette was one of the keynote speakers on that cruise. We worked together extremely well. As we cruised, I think, for nine days down to the ABC Islands. Yeah. It was, it was one of the experiences in my life that I will never forget at all. Kathy was on the podcast a couple of weeks before your episode comes out. I think hers comes out tomorrow. Uh, so I kind of slid her in there uh, special because I really do believe what she is doing is a tremendous ministry to people and not enough people know, number one, know about it. And number two, even consider traveling with somebody with dementia. And I'll be very frank. And I told her this, you know, being on this cruise as a, as a therapist with a background as a therapist, it totally changed how I look at traveling with somebody with dementia, because every single therapist will tell you don't travel. It's confusing to the person living with dementia keep them in their routine, stay as consistent as possible. And I have turned into like a total convert that it is the best thing ever. One of my clients right now, actually earlier this week, just we just had this conversation. Uh, it, we're recording this right before Easter and she's bringing her parents to her house in California for Easter. Uh, and she's worried about it setting her mom back. And I, I just said to her, I'm like, even if it does, I'm like, go enjoy it. Take her with you. Don't consider what the impact is going to be as to if it's going to maybe change her thinking for a bit. Live, go live. And that is what the cruise, that's the, the biggest thing the cruise actually taught me is to encourage people to actually go away, spend time together, and not just stick in the routine and familiar. So, you know, it's a very different viewpoint for a clinician to come to that agreement. But anyway, that was my little plug for Kathy's uh, elite cruises. So, Dennis, tell us well, a let little me, bit. Let me, let me add to that, Lizette, because I think it's important that I embellish what you were talking about. Absolutely. Um, my wife, Nancy, was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, she was then diagnosed with early onset in January of 2015 at age 62. And so once we her diagnosis of MCI came in, I retired, she retired, and we put together the idea that we were going to spend the time together and make memories while we still could. Mm -hmm. And so we did extensive travel. And in 2018, I found Kathy's group. And so Nancy and I went on our first cruise with friends from the Orlando area and enjoyed it tremendously to where then I had Nancy go on her second cruise with Kathy's group. Uh, and since that time, after after that second cruise with Kathy, Nancy was no longer able to travel. But that was five years into her disease. Mm -hmm. And so we get a point to where you can't travel much other than the family. And uh, the opportunity of going with Kathy's uh, dementia-supported cruises really created memories. 
memories mm-hmm. for me, not necessarily for Nancy, but I created picture books that allowed her to then take a look at what we did and, and maybe jog a memory or two, or at least give me the opportunity to tell stories about how important that time together was. So mm-hmm. I encourage, I'm a very strong advocate, and I think I think over the years, I've had at least a half dozen of my colleagues here in Orlando go on these cruises, and they are most appreciative. Even though it was difficult at times, they also learned and made memories that they're always appreciative for uh, now after their wives have passed. And so yeah. uh, very, very important. Very important for sure. Um, so tell us a little bit about Nancy because Nana's books is specifically related to Nancy. So tell us yeah. how Nana's books came about, uh, what made you decide to do it, and just the whole story about what you're doing. I think it's such a phenomenal uh, foundation. I don't know if you call it a ministry, but I would call it a ministry. <laughs> it sort of is that ministry, but it truly is a foundation. Nancy and I were married for 47 years, and she was a lifelong librarian. It loved books, loved reading, loved providing resources, and it was a tragedy when she could no longer read in her disease. Not only did she have trouble recognizing, remembering characters, but then putting words together into actual concepts became difficult for her in the disease. Well, at Christmas time, we exchanged gifts in our family. And for Nancy in her, in her dementia, buying her a present really wasn't as important. And my son, Mark, who lives in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, had a friend who was a teacher in a Title I school. And she was teaching kids. And so Mark bought books for each of the kids in her classroom in Nancy's honor for two years. And these kids then wrote letters to Nancy, which she absolutely loved reading or having them read to her. The pictures, the love from that, It really was there. And just a month before Nancy died, my son Mark had visited me in his last visit to to see his mom. Uh, We talked about how we were going to recognize Nancy's legacy. And the whole concept of giving books came to light. And so my other son also agreed. And we decided to to, to... to set up a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We decided to call it Nana's Books because Nancy wanted to be talked about as Nana. She loved the word Nana. She loved being a grandma. And so we we put it together with the Nana's Books and the logo that uh, you might be able to see on my shirt here, yep. uh, which shows a picture of an owl. And she loved owls. And so I had a friend create this logo, the concept, and it was formed in December of 2020. Nancy died in January of 2021. Okay. And I was able to share this with her while she was still alive, although at that point she was not commutative. But I did share the concept. I put this sign on her wall that uh, she could see whether she could understand, we don't know, but right. we make these efforts. So, But you knew. We and the family knew, and exactly. that's the important piece. And Absolutely. upon Nancy's passing, uh, we asked that all donations that would be done in her honor be sent to Nana's books. And so that was the mm-hmm. first creation of a fund, a nonprofit foundation. Well, that summer... Uh, in 2021, we decided to come up with a list of titles to donate to her hometown library Mm -hmm. in Granville, New York, and then reach out to her her school district in Granville, New York, which is a Title I school, and donate books to that school. 
Well, in 2022, we did do the donation to the books. In 2021, at uh, the time we interred her ashes up in Granville, we donated over 20 books to the Granville Pember Library in mm -hmm. her honor. And since then, we'll be donating additional books as we add to this collection because we're finding more and more great resources for adults and children that help them understand dementia, Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. and disabilities because we, we intend to increase kindness and compassion among all in these communities. And unfortunately, dementia is ever growing in our population. And it's a tragedy that families struggle with how they're dealing with working through support for their mm -hmm. grandparent, support for their parent, right. and then still feeling good about making memories. Right. So since that time, this year we've had an absolutely wonderful year. This year we've gone from one school in the first year to five, no, to, to uh, how many schools last year? Five schools last year. And this year we're at eight schools. And so we're donating to our 16th school in three years with a grand total of over 12 thousand books. I am very excited to announce this next part of our journey together. Once a month on a Thursday evening, I'm going to do a segment called Ask the Dementia Coach, where you can actually come into a coaching session with me and other people if they register for the same time so you can feel what it feels like to actually have dementia coaching. The reason I'm doing this is because I know so many of you guys are struggling on your own and may feel like you're at the end of your rope. And in order to help serve you better, I wanted to open up this opportunity once a month for you to register for a free Ask the Dementia Coach segment like I said, it will be Thursday evenings, once a month, six o'clock Eastern time in the evening. And the segment is called Ask the Dementia Coach. So if you're interested in signing up for that, the link will be in the show notes below. And I look forward to seeing you on one of these special sessions. That's amazing. So for people like me who might be, you know, not from the United States, and even though I do know what a Title I school is, some people listening may not actually know what a Title I school is. Can you tell people what a Title I school is and why it is specifically important that this these resources are going to a Title I school? Yeah, the, these Title I schools, they're very numerous in the United States. Mm -hmm. Title I schools typically are in communities that have a lower socioeconomic status, meaning yep. their average income is lower than the standard. And they receive additional federal funds. Well, they have a higher proportion of minority students. Mm -hmm. They have a higher proportion of students who come from families that may not use English as their primary language. Mm -hmm. And with the fact that they have lower income, these are families who really can't provide educational resources like books in their home. And so we've decided to focus on these Title I schools throughout the country and give them books so that each student gets at least one book that is grade appropriate, vetted by our organization, that pertains to dementia or disability. And sometimes they get additional resources. And just recently, we've added books in Spanish. Hmm. And the feedback we're getting from not only principals and faculty, but students. I just got a note this morning from a school up in Tennessee 
who says, who, who wrote to her teacher and said, I want to take the book out in Spanish so I could learn how to communicate with some of my students. Oh, wow. And this is a book that has both English and Spanish on the same page. So they're reading in English, reading in Spanish, and learning the fact that they can communicate. That's amazing. So how do you guys find the books? Because when you a couple of things come out in my mind immediately when you say grade appropriate, you know, and Spanish. There it and the the topic dementia and you know disabilities, there aren't that many people who write books for those Cat for that category. So how are you guys finding books and vetting the books that are going out to these kids? Well, I have a board of directors that include previous uh, book, book publishers, authors, teachers, uh, educators who are connected as well as parent with disability to be able to identify these books. And as we identify titles, and these titles are coming not just from our board of directors, they're coming from volunteers as well. Mm -hmm. We use Scholastics as our main source, and they put together uh, a, a group of books, probably, uh, I'm guessing, maybe over 100 books of their collection that uh, pertain to our criteria of dementia or disability. And now some of their titles are in Spanish. And so they become a source of great appropriate books because Scholastic does initial vetting and they identify the great appropriateness. And the additional titles we will actually vet by volunteers who uh, will also look at this. And frequently I'll be writing to the authors, getting them to help clarify what grade level, age level, this is appropriate for. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a growing network that's happening. And in year three, I'm just thrilled at uh, how we're developing a very, very compiled and vetted list. That, that's amazing. So is it mostly for the lower grade children or is it like all the way through high school or um, are you still donating books to some of the libraries or both? Well, all of the above, although recently uh, we've been focusing more on the primary grades. Uh, I think it's important that our foundation support literacy and education. Mm -hmm. And where does that start? It starts at pre-K, kindergarten, grade one, where we have found excellent resources and been able to actually network with the foundation in New York City, the American, uh, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, who've written two excellent books, one of them which in Spanish now, and they've been able to be one of our main sponsors who are giving us these resources uh, after we've paid for a couple of them. And it's wonderful because they want to share the information too among. Americans that want to help people and families that are suffering from Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful network. The fact that they now have one of the two titles in Spanish is phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. We're putting this resource now into the schools and public libraries. You talked about public libraries. Mm -hmm. and yes, uh, we're giving books to their neighboring public library that are both at the adult and kid level. And we, if we could find more resources at the adolescent level that we can vet appropriately, we're gonna do more of that. But the, the, right now, the focus seems to be more on the primary grades for legitimate reasons. Sure, absolutely. So um, what I find fascinating, and I know this is gonna sound a little bit out of left field, but I'm originally from South Africa and recently, like at the end of last year, I had lots of conversations with the Alzheimer's and Dementia Association of South Africa, 
to see if there's a way that I could work with them because dementia education and literacy in South Africa is vastly lacking. And um, one of the things that they really have come out with as an identifying a need in South Africa is for the education not to be going to the adult children of somebody living with dementia, but to the grandchildren who are in primary school and in high school because they are actually the primary caregiver. Yes. They're the ones that go home from school and take care of granny or granddad because either the the parent the the child of the person with dementia or the parent of the child has is either working to support the family or have passed away. And so it's this 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 groundswell of people, young people who need to be educated about what dementia is and how to help other people. So I truly see the value of teaching the the children, especially in these more, a lot of times, you know, Title I schools are very rural or they're very much in inner cities. And like you said, socioeconomically, not necessarily as as many resources. So I truly appreciate uh, the fact that you guys are, are working towards getting the information into the hands of young children. And then the, the second part of that is what a wonderful way of over time changing the narrative about dementia and dementia caregiving to become a little bit more positive and not so scary for people because, you know, quite frankly, that's really all you ever hear is how terrible it is. I was watching a television program and I find it very, I find it really great that they're including more people, more subplots and stories in television programs about dementia. But then I get so frustrated because the very second thing out of somebody's mouth is, well, there's nothing we can do. Well, maybe there's nothing we can do, but there's a lot we can do. You know, we don't have to struggle. We don't have to make it so it does not need to be as hard. But when there's this this negative connotation that it's the absolute, yes, it's hard, but that it's the worst thing ever. By bringing books into children, we can really start to change the the long term view of this process for people. So it's exciting to me. Yes, not only not only children, but the adult books that we're putting in these public libraries also have a positive twist on it mm -hmm. because I'm putting into these public libraries and adding to their collection. I make sure they don't have these books, first of all, because I hate to waste our resource on mm -hmm. buying books that might be duplicates. But yes, there are books like Activities to Do, 101 Ideas to Have Fun. And the positive effects. Mm -hmm. uh, I facilitate a men's support group who are taking care of wives or parents with dementia and bringing resources like this to their attention gives them the tools that can make those experiences more enjoyable. Absolutely. And granted, uh, the fact that uh, dementia is a terminal disease without any solution or way of curing it is not to throw up your hands and say, I give up. Exactly. It's, what do I have with time now that we can't predict how long that will be? No. But how do we make that the best experience we can and provide the loving care and compassion so that we enjoy that moment together? And this disease has been called the longest goodbye. Mm -hmm. For a good reason. It is a slow terminating disease in many cases. Right. Other ways, it does go quickly. In my case, it lasted seven years from the time of diagnosis. And those seven years were involved, as I mentioned earlier, in travel, in taking Nancy to, to see family. Mm -hmm. Getting involved in activities that supported her disease through brain fitness, musical yep. minds, 
Art's the Spark at the at the art museum. Uh, she loved plays. She loved music. We continue to do that. She loved sporting events and look out referees because uh, <laughs> she was definitely going to get on their case when she saw something that was wrong. <laughs> so it was always it was always a treat to do that with her until it got to a point where crowds became a problem. Mm -hmm. Out, outside noise became a problem. Uh, her mood swings became more regular. And I had to make that very, very hard decision of placing her in a memory care facility. Mm -hmm. And that is difficult. And men yeah. struggle with this. Women, I'm sure, mm -hmm. struggle with it because we think that we can take care of it. And men, especially, who are fixers mm -hmm. are very frustrated because they can't fix dementia. Yeah. yeah. I actually had a one-on-one um, -on -one conversation with one of my coaching clients this morning before we recorded this. And I use um, evidence-based tools and practices to help track people's stress levels. And the conversation was, you know, his stress levels are at a level where we need to implement actionable strategies now or else he will burn out. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it was a, a very open and honest and frank conversation. And we did touch on what are the options? Is memory care an option? Our, our goal in the coaching is to try to keep her at home. But it also, I also recognize like, Way back when, when I was young and dumb, I'm like, try to keep everybody at home. Well, you can tune up, you, you cannot ever say that. You know, some people really do need a memory care. Some people can stay at home. It depends on every person's unique situation. I've had many people in lower socioeconomic situations, but were there big families? where they, they all take turns and so they're able to do it. So every person's situation is different, but recognizing that, yes, memory care is not the worst decision to necessarily make. It is sometimes the best decision for the person living with dementia as well as the people who are helping them. As difficult a decision as it is, it can be the right decision for the person for the for the entire situation, you know there are a lot of people out there who say never put anybody in a in a in a memory care or in a facility, and I'm not like that. It, it if we can, we do, but if we cannot, it is a good it's a good solution for the right person. I know a lot of my my guys worry about Plan B. What happens if their wife? succeeds them and they pass mm -hmm. away first because unfortunately people who are caregivers do die because mm -hmm. of the stress or their medical conditions or a significant accident that takes their life away and so we frequently talk about what are the options what if we lay out in advance have you done all of the legal documents necessary and involve your spouse so that they're a player and the family knows what your wishes are. Yep. And that is so crucial to be able to do that early on in the disease. Absolutely. We are starting to get more and more opportunities for early identification. I think yes. the issue of why, why are we seeing such a growth in dementia numbers is because early identification Identification and people are coming out and trying to find out, even though that information could be very, very negative, long range. The, the whole stigma, unfortunately, is there, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to break that. And I believe Nana's books is helping to counter that stigma Absolutely. with education. Absolutely. And I'm very, very proud that uh, we're making inroads here. Uh, we are, I think I mentioned we are currently in eight states, and my personal goal is to be in each state during my lifetime. Oh, well, uh, we have a lot of work to do, Dennis. We, we're going to yeah. get this. 
<laughs> we are, we're going to get there. So um, how many, what's the goal for this year? So you've almost doubled it from last year. So what's the goal for this year? And well, how our, can our board, support, support our your goal? Our board has not yet set a goal for next year. No, I uh, meant this still, year. Uh, this year, we, we, have, we have finished our, almost finished our distribution of our, our over 6,000 books to our eight schools. Uh, and so next year, we will determine that. We're in a process of uh, obtaining the resources necessary to fund this venture because it doesn't come cheap. Right. These books are, be are books that we are buying and then having to ship. And uh, USPS has raised their rates. <laughs> and so, yeah, it becomes a factor. Uh, the, uh, we're we're, we're going to be looking for grant funding. And major corporate sponsors this year, besides individual sponsors. But on our webpage, we have the opportunity to, to receive donations. And our webpage is nanasbooks.org. Can't be much sim more simpler than nope. nanasbooks.org. And the opportunity to either donate or volunteer your time. Volunteer time to vet books, suggest titles. Uh, or get involved in other ways because uh, the opportunities are here. And unfortunately, the numbers keep increasing in terms of the number of families affected by sure. dementia. Uh, so I don't so, know if this came out on the cruise, but I'm in the process of writing a book. And so it is supposed to come out at the end of this year. So I will see if we can donate and, and they will not be for children. I was sitting as we were talking, I'm, I'm like, you know, writing a book for children about dementia would be very difficult for me. I'm, I'm, I'm not like, I don't know that I could, I don't know that I could actually write a book for kids. That, that would be like the biggest challenge for me to actually write a book for children. Uh, but the book I'm writing is for adults and for family caregivers, because I believe that we are not doing a good job. I believe the healthcare system has failed family caregivers. They are making it even harder to be a family caregiver, and family caregivers do not have the, the, the help they need. So I'm really focusing on family caregivers as opposed to, you know, it's not a a lot of ink's been spilled about, spilled about what is dementia and stuff like that. My book is very is going to be very different and more focused on the family, more focused on the, the family caregiver. Kind yeah, of like Tony's to hear. Book. Yeah, the the advocacy you're bringing, Lizette, to this topic is is highly commendable, and any proceeds you wish to donate to Nana's books will be graciously accepted. Oh, for sure. Uh, as I talked about sponsors. Did you know that caring for a person with dementia doesn't have to be this hard? If you are struggling and you would like to join our next free workshop, I invite you to walk away with science-backed dementia caregiving skills that many professionals don't even know after attending this free workshop. If you'd like to register, message me the word workshop on Instagram or check out the link in the show notes below. Uh, the opportunity for a corporate sponsor is amazing here because for a $5,000 donation from a corporate sponsor, they will be able to identify a Title I school in their geographical area, their city, their state. And that's what's going to help us get to our 50-state connection. Absolutely. Because there are co companies here that have executives and staff who are affected by dementia or disability. And it would be great support to their, to their staff and their community and their educational system to be able to provide these resources. And so that's the goal this year is to expand the amount of support we're getting so that we can then expand the amount of Title I schools in different states. 
Yeah, this is this is such a I'm I'm so excited that we're having this conversation because you know, it's a different way of of looking at um dementia caregiving for families because we all we all recognize at some point or another the the dementia caregiving journey ends. And I just think that you are such a testimony of what can be what good can come out of the ashes the the way that you are bringing Nancy's legacy forward but also how how it's going to impact this it's like it's like a tree right the 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 tree is growing we're not necessarily going to see the changes today uh, but impacting these children 10 15 20 30 years from now, Nancy's legacy is going to still be there and it's going to continue to grow and expand as each of these children start to become more aware of how to interact or how to be around or how what it even is or not to be afraid of it. I just see such a tremendous uh, mission for this, this for Nana's book. So I'm I'm very excited about it. Well, I appreciate you inviting me, Lizette, because this uh, podcast is another opportunity to share this information Absolutely. and perhaps reach out to somebody who either individually wants to get involved or mm -hmm. knows somebody who's affected, who could be inspired by the fact that they too can make a difference. And that's exactly what Nana's Books is doing. We've now touched over 6,000 students in these mm. schools and eight communities. Yeah, and so that's amazing. it's a start. It's a start that uh, yeah, only but we can... have to dream big. And I've done with 50 states. I think that's a pretty good, pretty good dream. There are over 40,000 Title I schools in the United States. Wow. We won't touch them all, but by starting in this way, we'll break down some barriers, we'll break down some of the stigmas, we'll get people talking and showing that kindness and compassion. That's essential from grandkids to grandparents, mm -hmm. sons and daughters to mom and dads. Yep. Because we need to have that strong support team that can only help create memories. Yep. And that's my personal goal. And I, I believe I've, I've, I'm reaching out at the appropriate time to be able to do this. Yeah, I think this, I think, I think you're going to get into all 40,000 Title I schools. Not, <laughs> not in a year, but I think that if, if, you know, a foundation like this has the potential of doing that over time, for sure. I'm going to I'm going to dream big for you. I'm going to dream big. So for people who are wanting to um, reach out, the website again is nanasbooks.org, correct? Correct. And there's an email address that they can write to us at nanasbooks21 at gmail.com. Well, there you go. And for anybody who is listening, we will be putting all of this information in the show notes. Uh, Dennis really has a heart for people living with dementia. I can attest to it. I have seen him work with, uh, we had nine adults on the cruise that we went on. And just the love and support and care that Dennis demonstrated to the person living with dementia, but, it, but not more than just that, the family caregivers. Dennis was one of the people who did the the caregiver circles to provide the caregivers some opportunities to uh, appropriately talk about some of the struggles that do come with being a family caregiver. I had the joy of taking care of the person living with dementia while the family caregiver circles were being done. So I never got to see that side, but uh, Dennis's heart is for these people living with dementia and supporting their family caregivers. So Dennis, when you send me all of the information for the show notes, um, also send the information for the men's group. Perhaps, you know, you do that virtually, right? I do one time a month virtually. 
on the uh, third Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Zoom call. Matter of fact, I have people now attending from four different states. Exactly. Not just Florida. And so that's why that's why I wanted to put it out there because men's groups are not as well formed as groups for women, daughters, you know, wives, that kind of thing. So actually having a men's group, if there are people who are listening and are able to join virtually once a month, I think it's another resource we can give people. Yep. And if they don't join, I send out uh, a, a rash of attachments <laughs> and information that can help support and, and sometimes uh, provide just the incentive they need to do better. Not a rasher. Not a rasher, because as we learned on the cruise, a rasher is... Bacon. One slice. Bacon. One slice of bacon. That's an inside joke because I did not know what a rasher of bacon was. So Dennis educated me. So it's it's a long state. It's going to be a forever joke between the two of us. Dennis, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for this for this resource for all these resources and uh, for doing this doing this for Nancy and doing Nana's books because this is this is definitely a work of love. Um, but such a legacy. And that is the encouragement I want people to actually take today is that we can make legacy after a dementia caregiving journey. Um, and somebody else's legacy may look a little bit different, but we can still create a legacy for the person that we loved and supported. And I just I just am excited to see where Nana's books goes. So I thank you for being here today and we look forward, I look forward to maybe being on another cruise with you later. Very good, Lisette. Good luck to you and thank you again for this uh, very generous invitation. You are very welcome. All right, well, thank you guys for being here today and listen to the next episode. Thanks for joining me today, Success Seeker. I pour my heart and soul into this program to serve you. You can serve me by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. And join our free Facebook group, Dementia Caregiving for Families. It's a positive and proactive space to navigate dementia caregiving together. Get practical tools and find support, but without the verbal vomit. Be a part of our community where we seek to find peace of mind and ease despite the dementia diagnosis. So join today and see you next time as our flight takes off. <laughs>